in the Roman matrix, not the Reformation matrix, because I was asking him questions he wasn't interested in. So every year we went back and we, we didn't try to just go where Paul went, like Ephesus say. We went where we could see his world most clearly, whether he ever went there or not. So for example, Aphrodisias became the place we wanted to go. Our, um, anywhere we could see the, the Roman world, whether he went there. In Aphrodisias, for example, there was a, an avenue 30 feet, 30 feet high, a, a thin avenue with, you know, I can imagine when you went down there, your, your neck would be sore looking up. And what you were seeing was Greek myths, conquered nations, imperial things. You were getting a magnificent propaganda, dear Greeks. Your destiny was to be Roman. Welcome home. Magnificent art, magnificent propaganda. This was what was imperial, Roman imperial theology. And yeah, I wasn't talking about emperor cult or Roman civil. This was Roman imperial theology. And in the light of Roman imperial theology, Pauline Christian theology snapped into place like that. It was like, you know, two things suddenly coming into focus. It all made sense. So it was, strictly speaking, going around all of these places in Turkey, especially in Turkey, more, more so even in Greece, to be honest with you, because a lot of the places where Paul was in Greece, like Thessaloniki, you, you can't, there's a big city sitting on top of it. it. It was, Turkey had more options, more room that you could see Roman ruins, better than Israel. That's why we went to Israel once, to be honest with you. You know, a small country that was almost destroyed in the first century. Turkey, big white country and stuff all over the place still, first century stuff. So we love going, that's where Paul made sense to me. Well, and, and for me, uh, that moment where it just really clicked for me was in Priene, with that beam. That, yes. Yes, right, and, and the saying there. Uh, so uh, remind me uh, what that says. Okay, let me tell you that. Let me give you the backstory of it. Um, we were on a tour, and Priene wasn't on our tour. We were going to pass Priene. We were down, I think, somewhere south, and we were going back to, to uh, Kuchidassi. And we asked, our, with the tour, with our 40 people, and we said, could you drop us off at Priene? Uh, we want to take a look at it to see if it might be of interest next year when we come back, and we have to send a taxi from the hotel. So they dropped the two of us off, and there was an Anglican priest from um, Chicago said, can I come? Come on. So we're wandering around this place, and he suddenly shouts, come over here, come over here. I didn't see, find it. We have this giant beam with letters this big. And what it says, it's a dedication that used to be the architrave above the door, and it's fallen down, and they've set it up so you can read it. And it says the people, the Hodemus, it's in Greek, dedicate this to Athena, patroness of the city, Athena, and to... Imperator, it's autocrator in Greek, Caesar, the son of God, it's the same word used for uh, in Mark's opening, Theu Huias, the God Augustus. So, Imperator Caesar, the son of God, the God Augustus, Sebastus. And Sebastus is from the Greek root Sebomai, to worship. It's the word you get the God worshippers in Acts from. So, the God to be worshipped. You, you know, it's left hanging. Well, aren't the other ones to be worshipped? Or is this the God to be worshipped? You know, yes, of course, all the others. So Sebastos, I mean, Augustus, we kind of got used to it. That's his name, like Mr. and Mrs. Augustus, his little boy Augustus or something. But it's really a transcendental title. It means the God to be worshipped, especially in Greek. Augustus, Sebastos means the God to be worshipped. And so at that point, again, we said, oh yeah, we're coming back here every and every other year we did. But we literally stumbled over that. We, I didn't know what we were doing. We were wandering around Priene. I don't think we had done any research. We didn't even know we were at the temple of Athena, the main temple of the city. I think we just stumbled on it. 
Yeah, and that's what's just so fascinating is just, yeah, there's almost this accident. of We didn't discover it. I mean, the whole world probably knew it was there, but we actually saw it. Later when I went looking at books, I found, yeah, people knew it was there. And in a lot of books, we, we saw it wasn't um, transcribed properly. They, they left out one part of it. It was the Son of God, the God Augustus, Theohuias, you know, Sebastos. So it was the full, the full panoply. Now, one other th important thing there, we would think that surely Son of God, that's the most important title. But the title that always comes first is that Imperator, Autocrator in Greek, Imperator in Latin. We translate it as Emperor. And it really doesn't mean Emperor because it's it said, for example, that Augustus was declared Imperator 10 times or 20 times. I would translate it as Conqueror. And of course, when it's used of Augustus, it means World Conqueror because nobody else is going to get that title. It was the old title that was given to a general on the field of battle after he had won the victory. And if he wanted to have a triumphal march in Rome, the first question was, did your soldiers on the field of victory proclaim you imperator? So not emperor, not ruler, victor would be the proper translation, I think. Augustus and its world conqueror. So the most important thing for Roman imperial theology Actually, he's not son of God, even, or God Sebastus. What justifies that as a transcendental title is that you have conquered the world. And that we want to say, come on, all you've conquered is a bit of the Mediterranean or a swath of the Levant or something. But they don't talk about conquer of Italy or the Mediterranean, it's the world. And that gorgeous marble statue in, in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg shows him holding in his, the rod of command in his right hand. It's a rod, it goes back to the spear of command with the rod. And then the world, the orb of the world's in his left hand with victory, Nike, on top of it. So for them, what justified their title as son of God, God, Sebastian, all the rest of it, was victory. <laughs> 